Hi, I'm Steve Rizzani, and you're watching The Crew Reviews. Because look who's here from the up north, great white, Steve Yerzani. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Great to see you guys. Great to see you. Long anticipated. Yeah. Long anticipated. Glad, glad you're here. Cheers to that. That it is. So uh, welcome, Steve. So we've all been friends since uh, 2019 when we first crossed paths at Thriller Fest in New York City. Uh, it's been quite a journey since then. So yeah. now we've had the privilege of getting to know you on social media and in person. But for some of our viewers who mightn't be new to your background, uh, you're proudly Canadian, right? I am, yeah. And your impressive career spans over 30 years as a paramedic in Toronto, where, where you also served as a tactical medic with the Ontario uh, Police. And uh, your, expertise covers, police, yeah. Yeah, your expertise covers a wide range from chemical, biological, uh, radiological, nuclear, explosive incident response. Uh, topics that will certainly come into play when readers dive into your debut. Perfect shot. So with this fascinating background, can you, get, can you offer us a sneak peek into what readers can expect within the pages of this book? Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. How are you, Sean? Nice to see you as well. Good. And yeah, we go back a long ways already. It we seems. do, yeah. So that's pretty cool. But um, Perfect Shot took shape. Actually, it was interesting. I stumbled on an old screenplay that I had begun back in 2013. And the character's name in that story was Rachel. But as I read through the screenplay, I realized this is Alex. Ten years before I wrote about Alex, or almost ten years, seven, eight years, whatever it was. So the character of Alex has been kind of churning around in my mind for a while. She was in Amsterdam at the time. She was attached to The Hague. This forerunner to Alex. Um, but I guess it took some years to percolate in my mind a little bit. And uh, basically, I came up with the idea of I, I wanted a, a tough, um, no nonsense. I actually didn't intend to write a female protagonist. So it, it didn't happen in any contrived form. But I tried to write male characters. And they just weren't sounding right on the page. The story wasn't going anywhere. But once I stumbled on the backstory for Alex um, as the uh, the FBI special agent attached to Interpol. Um, and then I gave her some of my background and my expertise in chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosives incident response. That's a big mouthful. Can you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> um, she started to come together. And um, like you said, she's been, uh, you know, she's a, she's a tough character. Um, I, I've, been in the business for thir actually over 40 years now, 30 years in EMS, 10 years in emergency management. And I've met some really tough, strong um, female characters. And right. uh, they've all found their way into making Alex who she is in the story. So uh, so the in the thriller verse, so FBI Special Agent Alexandra Alex Martell, she isn't your typical protagonist, right? So she's 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 a decorated, renowned, former, Army Special Operations Sniper. Um, and she isn't working in the typical FBI field office. She's not like the Washington field office or the New York City field office. As you mentioned, um, she's over at Interpol. She's in Amsterdam. So mm -hmm. with that story, I know, I know you, you had that character in that screenplay, but the story around her, you just slot her into it? Or was it something that was part of the screenplay and you just brought over into the story of uh, yeah. Perfect Shot? So the original screenplay um, started uh, with uh, the backstory of that was what became the first manuscript I wrote with Alex Martell in it. And that became the story called By a Long Shot. And she was the, she was an Interpol lady. She's in The Hague, actually not Amsterdam, but she's, she's in The Hague. Um, so that's a good question because the original story involved, the backstory was the siege of Sarajevo back in the mid-90s. 
and her father had been a general um, because her backstory at the time was Canadian. So her father was a Canadian general at the time, working in Sarajevo um, with the inter in with the uh, the international, uh, you know, the the Blue Berets, basically right. the peacekeeping force that was there. Peacekeepers, yeah. And um, it revolved around his actions in Sarajevo and what triggered the the bad guys in the story, if you will, or the not so much the bad guys as the people who got the story going, a brother and sister duo, to start taking out uh, Serbian generals around Europe. That's what the original story was. And Alex, being with Interpol, was chasing after them, sniper on, it was more sniper on sniper. Right. So Alex's backstory, as you said, she, uh, you know, for reasons you can imagine, was massaged into much more of a, a U.S. Army, FBI backstory. And so, with her... You know, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, with her, so with that kind of specialty, um, we found ways, or I found ways to figure out, you know, how would it work that... A woman, first of all, can be a sniper in the U.S. Army, and we know that that's almost a even today is a a pretty it's a long shot, right? For, yeah, for a woman yeah. to no pun intended, that. no pun intended. Well, total pun intended, but you know, <laughs> it's a bird talking. So I had to figure out a way, and Josh Hood gave me some insights into how I might do that. So we talked about that a little bit with Josh. So I really made it. Uh, it was kind of a side incident that happened to Alex in, during her tour in Afghanistan, where she was a combat medic was her military occupational specialty. And because of the action of going on around her and her, her platoon had come under fire, hit an ID and hit an ambush while she was delivering aid to some forward positioned um, uh, tier one operators, um, she fell into that sniper role out of necessity. She had to pick up a sniper rifle. And that's what gave her that specialty in the story rather than me plunk her into a, a background of sniper school and all of that she had to pick up the sniper rifle. And that's what led her to becoming, she was quite a natural on the sniper rifle behind the scope. And that led her to become quite the renowned sniper yeah. through both the army and then intelligence support activity, intelligence afterwards, and then on into uh, a normal life, so to speak, in the civilian world of the FBI and on to Interpol. Where she's still a badass. She is still a badass. Well, Steve, many thriller authors, whether they're an attorney who writes you know, law thrillers or a doctor like Michael Crichton who, who started out with medical thrillers or their law enforcement military background, they tend to craft protagonists with similar experience. And I know there's some of your background in here, but in your case, despite being a medic professional, your protagonist is, as you guys just discussed, a sniper. So can you share a little bit about your research process for developing that authentic skill set for this unique character? Did you, was there anybody in particular you sought guidance from with sniper backgrounds to ensure accuracy, because as we've been told by several authors, even a small detail can be scrutinized and harped on by readers. Absolutely. Um, so a number of years ago when I was uh, uh, writing manuscript number one, we'll call it, um, I sought out, I have a good friend of mine was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces and the commanding officer of the 3rd Battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. So 3 PPCLI is a really historic regiment in Canada. And he uh, became a good friend of mine through some work we had done years ago. And he introduced me to someone who introduced me to someone who introduced me to this ex, uh, I think I can say it. I know some people have had their hands slapped lately, but a JTF-2 sniper. So we'll call him a Special Operations Forces, Canadian Special Operations Forces sniper. Right. And Perry, he's mentioned in my acknowledgement, so I can say his name, but Perry introduced me to the field craft of shooting and took me out precision shooting. So I'd done a lot of YouTube research and I have some precision shooting books behind me on the shelf. And uh, I learned a lot about the science of it, but it was Perry who took me out into the field, got me crawling on my belly and hiding in trees to practice the craft of actually some long range shooting. So I'm by no means competent <laughs> at it. I enjoy it. I would love to do some more of it, but that's that was the background I got was a little some tutoring from uh, an ongoing tutoring and checking of my writing from this uh, good friend of mine, Perry. Very well, cool. I wonder. I wonder if you um, if you felt you got more out of, or if you were able to put more into the story by you actually doing that or by reading it. Like which which one actually weighed more? Oh, that's a good question, Chris. Um, the reading it and watching it 
you know, it gives, gives you an appreciation for the technical aspect of it and how challenging and difficult it is. Um, the calculations, I mean, you know, you guys have, I'm sure, dabbled and delved into um, what's required to become it's, anywhere near competent as a precision long range shooter. Yeah, it's an art and a science. Totally. Absolutely. And so that gave me the sort of background of, you know, wow, that's a, quite an incredible skill to to have this knowledge base and be able to apply it. But then sitting out in the field and you've got a, you know, the, the rifle stock pressed into the, your shoulder and you're looking through the scope and you're, I'm trying to put my mindset into someone who's actually in the field. So, you know, having the, learning the, the skills on paper or on video or whatever, that's one thing, but yeah, to actually be out there, you know, putting lead down range, steel right. down range, it's a, uh, it's a totally different animal. That's pretty cool. And, and, and did you, um, did you forward any of those, the shooting moments in the story to your guy and oh. have him look over it? And he was just like, this is crap or this is fantastic. Yeah, no, luckily it wasn't, it was the latter. Um, yeah. A lot of them. So, uh, you know, when it was some time for, there's some calculations in, in perfect shot right. um, that I've, I actually probably had the formulas even in there in one of the original drafts, but um, those calculations all were either uh, initiated by or run by my friend to make sure I got them right. Matter of fact, I probably sent it to him 10 times just saying, you know, dude, you got to double check because I'll get crucified <laughs> if I get this wrong. Yeah, and he knew it. So one star, <laughs> perfect yeah, shot. Exactly. <laughs> He did exactly. the calculations. The rest wrong. of the book was good, but he missed it by he said millimeters instead of mills. It was terrible. Yeah, yeah, one star. So, uh, so the opening scenes of of Perfect Shot are set in Netherlands, and I understand you have an intriguing story to share about your experiences during the research phase for that book in that particular location. And I wonder if you could share it with us. I'd love to. Uh, yeah, Lynn and I flew over uh, in twenty two, the summer of twenty twenty two, to do some of the sort of follow up research. I mean. Google is great. You guys know how wonderful Google is in books. You can you can read till the cows come home, but until you can get boots on the ground somewhere and smell a place, feel a place, see a place, you know, all that, um, you're, you're still missing an, a, an essential ingredient to the story. So Lynn and I flew over to, we were staying in Amsterdam. We drove to Arnhem, which is where the opening scene takes place, just outside Arnhem initially. And um, as we were approaching Dillon Airfield, which is a former military base. Well, it was former, but it's still an operational helicopter base and training base in the Netherlands. I approached this gate and of course, big sign, you know, the gates down, big signs, uh, you know, basically do not enter. Um, and as I pulled a U-turn, there was a military Jeep coming up the road. Turned out he was a, I think he was a captain, maybe a colonel at the airfield. And he asked us, you know, basically what what the heck you doing here so i explained that i was an author and i'd written this story and he took immediate interest and rather than you know ball us out or give us heck or shoot us or anything like that we actually drove down the road to another historic uh, ruin well actually the building wasn't ruins but among some other ruins there was a big building standing and we stood there as he pulled a binder out of his car and gave us the entire background to the, the deal in airfield Holy the, the occupation of the area um, by the Germans and the Axis powers until the Allies came in, um, how that airfield acted as a staging area to return equipment back to uh, to Western countries. In particular, it was heavily used by the Canadians, unbeknownst to us at the time. So it was uh, it was quite an experience. It turned out he was a historic officer with the military, and that was his role was educating. <laughs> locals and government officials on the history <laughs> of the airfield and literally right into roll into him. It ran right into him. Dude, that's that is uh, pretty that. pretty amazing. Yeah, and then cool. actually the next stop we made was to the the opening sequence in the book takes place sort of the next airfield over. Um and he asked if we knew how to get there and we said, well we've got a map, we'll be fine. And he actually said, just follow me. And he he led us convoy style, you know, 15 minutes down the road to this other airfield, which is now used as a glider base. Huh. Uh, so, uh, did yeah, you have to hand over your on. passport though? To like, you look over your. I, I didn't. No. So, you know, wow. we, I mean, I don't like to use the Canadian thing very often, but it's obvious. We're friendly, happy, <laughs> smiling people. We say thank you a lot. And he's, he's not from Jersey, Sean. He knew. He's not, he's not from, from Jersey. Jersey. You don't like to use the Canadian thing very often. Sure, sure. sure. <laughs> well, 
the perfect shot is a it's a globe spanning expansive storyline multiple players kind of like the love child of robert ludlum and stephen hunter uh and yet at the heart of it it's also an intimate introduction to a terrific character in alex martell as you were developing the draft what were your mental checkpoints for both story development and character kind of how did you strike that such a rich balance between the two because i you did you you nailed it thank you that's a good question um you know, that was a lot of work, I guess. You know, Perfect Shot, luckily, was the second book in a series. And the first book, my agent and I went out with, by a long shot, um, right at the start of the pandemic. So we pulled it back. It had already received two rejections. Um, the landscape, New York was shutting down, everywhere was shutting down. So I think Perfect Shot was easier to write and more rounded as a story because of my experience writing what essentially became the thesis for Alex Martell and the Alex Martell series. So there was a lot of trial and error, I guess, that went into that first one. I don't know if ever if it ever would have been picked up or not. Maybe fate intervened and, and didn't give us a choice when we pulled it back. And John Talbot, my agent, said, you know, you're already working on the next one, the follow-up to buy a long shot. Let's go out with that when it's ready, which became perfect, perfect shot. So there was that, but also I'm lucky that I've, uh, my wife, Lynn, is a really avid reader in a thriller genre, actually any genre, she'll read everything. Um, so if ever I was going astray, Lynn would read my pages and pull me back in and reel me in. And if she didn't do it while I was writing, because I wasn't handing over pages regularly, certainly by the end of it, when she was reading, if there was stuff off the mark, uh, she would definitely be my check and balance, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so there's a little, in there's something interesting in the story, and, and I'm curious how you found out about it, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it. Um, there's several what, interesting things in the story. Yeah, I know, there are several, but I, <laughs> safe, I'm just, I, Steve, I'm notorious for giving away, like, spoilers and stuff, so, like, I'm kind of, like, beating around this bush. Um, what three words? Yes. So, uh, you know, it's somewhat of a pivotal role in the story. Could you, could you one, tell us how you found out about it and what makes it so unique? So that's a great question, how I found out about it. Um, I, I think probably I was reading through an article at some point. I don't, I, I don't think I had, uh, I wasn't into their newsletters yet, wasn't getting that information, but I either heard on the news or saw on the news someone had been out the wilderness lost and stuck and injured in the wilderness and they called it might i don't know if it was the canadian wilderness or the u.s wilderness it's all trees and bush when you once <laughs> you're out there right and i think they called got a hold of a 911 operator who finally said to them because they had no idea where they were pull this app up on your phone down luckily they had cell service obviously so they still could access data download this app on your phone and tell us where you are so when i read that and then i followed up by my own research and saw how much that app is being used by emergency services and rescue services worldwide now, I realized this is a great little hook for the story. At the time, <laughs> two years ago when I wrote it, it was pretty cutting edge and new, but I think most people by the time Perfect Shot hits the, 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 the bookshelves, the bookstores, um, they're gonna know a little bit about that, but- um, Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Maybe I not, mean... but I, I found it really intriguing that it's, uh, you know, it breaks the world down into 10 foot by 10 foot squares, three meter by three meter squares. And each square is assigned three words to define that exact square anywhere in the world. And I believe it was concert promoters who, who developed WhatsApp to begin with. They were tired of telling the roadies which door to go to, trying to describe which door to go to for the roadies and stagehands to get the equipment in. So it was that inspiration that allowed them to break things down to this, these 10 foot by 10 foot squares and you can't go wrong with something that, you know, micro. So that was, uh, that's where that came from in the story. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Very, very, very. And I think readers will yeah. be intrigued by it because I, I know. was obviously very well used, very well used. Well, you finished Perfect Shot before the war in Ukraine hit its apex and long before Hamas rolled this powder keg into Israel. Mm. But there are always conflict hotspots around the world. As a thriller writer, how do you navigate the real world versus the fictional world in the sense of 
is it difficult to create fiction where the stakes rival the current geopolitical environment? And second part of that question, do actual events ever temper or change what you write, whether it's because too similar or because maybe traumatic events might be too fresh? Yeah, great question. And I, could, I, I can't tell you how many times I would be watching the news after I had finished Perfect Shot and we had gone out on subs or, you know, we were waiting for it to publish that I was panicking by work with world events um, or hearing about a book written by another author or whatever. So, I mean, whenever you're writing, you know, truth adjacent, history adjacent, um, it, it's a challenge and it's, it is scary because the closer you try to get to it, the greater the chance your storyline will be disrupted or will come true. But in reality, if you look at how many times, I mean, look at all the books we've all read and how similar the stories can be, you know, someone chasing down a nuclear warhead. I mean, that's not a new story, but it's how the author handles it that makes it new or puts a new twist on it or whatever it is. So whether it's Mitch Rapp or whether it's, you know, a Tom Clancy, a Jack Ryan, or whether it's, um, whether it's Alex Martell or anybody else, the, you know, Jack Carr had something in his, I won't give any or too much away, but I, in book five, mm -hmm. uh, was it in the blood? I think that's book five, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. There's something similar. So there's always going to be truth adjacent, history adjacent, reality adjacent events that, that you hope don't get too close and bump you to the margins or footnotes of history or thriller writer dumb. Um, so you do worry about that. When it comes to revising, I had, so the second book that's coming out, so that's already been turned into my publisher, um, just to kind of fast forward a bit and jump away from your question for a moment, Sean, it had, I began to write it before um, the Ukraine war started, or before the invasion, we call it the Ukraine war, the special military operation conducted by the Russians. Um, I began to write it with the idea that Finland was trying to get into, into NATO and that trouble was brewing to try to prevent Finland from getting into NATO. And as the story developed, things in the Ukraine developed and Finland is now in NATO along with thankfully Sweden just recently. Just, so just recently. Yeah. Yeah. So I was worried, but I, you know, you just have to kind of go with a story a little bit and write it. Um, I was talking the other day, you mentioned the tragic circumstances of, Hamas attacking Israel, and now, of course, Israel fighting for its life back. Um, and one way that I've seen writers handle those situations, Nelson DeMille comes to mind as one. Um, I was watching a show the other day that did it as well, and I can't remember what it was, but where you can take a historical circumstance, so it's happened already, and write back to it. So in, mm -hmm. in, interject your characters into that moment in time. So I had thought about doing that for the book I'm working on now. I've decided not to. I'm going to stay away from that whole Israeli Gaza situation. Um, but it can be done, obviously, where people, uh, you know, Nelson DeMille talked about the falling of the towers. I don't remember which book it was, but he reflected he Night. had. Like something. Night, Night Angel? Nightfall? Nightfall. 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 That's right. So in Nightfall, I think at the end of the story, he talks about it. And it's only a snippet. But it, it was such a powerful moment to me when I saw him do that. And I read that line that, hey, what, like, he has just introduced a moment in history, a pivotal moment in history into a story that was so emotionally impactful for everybody reading that because that book came out maybe a year after, maybe two years after 9 yeah. 11. So, so yeah, there's different ways to handle it. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, but, you know, I try to get as close as I can. And hope that history doesn't wipe out <laughs> all my attempts. Yeah. I mean, Brad Thor, I'm sure, must stay up at night worrying about what he's writing. No, I, I think Brad Thor just stays up at night going, you know what, this book is going to be true in the in six months because yeah. it seems to happen every damn time he writes a book six months yeah. later. It's straight from the pages of this. <laughs> exactly. Kind of yeah. How many? Yeah. How many tweets or it's Facebook posts lot. have you seen of him doing like it's in this book? It's in this book. And yeah. Like what, wow. What got, what got me thinking about that? And the, and the second part was the part I was thinking about. Now I know your book doesn't deal with Hamas attacking Israel, but I, I, I always wonder like it, could, if you're writing something and it's it's a thriller set in the real world, and then something so brutal and awful as what what happened in October. 
uh, in early October in Israel happens, you know, does that does that temper, you know, for me, for me, fi thriller fiction, my mom one time read something I wrote. She's oh, my gosh, you're such a nice boy. How can you write something so awful? And I said to her, I said, well, mom, in the real world, um, you know, the dragon doesn't usually get slayed like we'd like to. So I said fiction is a time where we can kind of slay the dragons and and right the wrongs and and the hero can win and, and such. Um, and, and that's always kind of been my approach, but uh, it's just a strange thing. But, you know, the the, the families, I, I've been reading all these accounts of these uh, Israelis going back to the kibbutz. I don't know how, if that's how you pronounce it. And um, and defending, you know, their little village and people going back and, and from the United States, from everywhere. And it reminded me way back in 1987, one of my favorite book series is actually it's a it's a trilogy by morell it starts out with the brotherhood of the rose and then fraternity of stone which are two unrelated books but then they connect in the league of night and fog and the ending of the league of night and fog a very similar thing is it doesn't it's not even a big part of the book it's kind of like the afterward but they're in this little kibbutz and in, in israel and it gets attacked by these extremists and that's kind of like the, the way the book ends and it and i was thinking about how first of all how you know how cyclical that that yeah. kind of situation is there, but also just like, you know, is it difficult or, and I want to know if you'd had that experience where you're writing something you're like, God, this is a little too close to the bone to what's really happening. Should I, should I pause this? Should I temper it? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I, and I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, whether I've been writing it or thinking it, uh, there are times when I've moderated my approach to a scene or, uh, my, you know, uh, my outline, something I wanted to do that I'm thinking, I'm not going to do that anymore. It's just too, it's just too close. It's just too ugly. Yeah. It's, it, you know, I, when I'm writing, you know, I, I think as writers, most of us aim to bring the reader or carry the reader into a place where it's escapism. It's entertainment. Mm -hmm. I don't like, I, I don't want to be, you know, I'm a, a 30 years of paramedic. There's stuff I don't want to talk about, stuff I don't want to see again. I've seen, I, I can't unsee I don't want to see it. I don't want to write about it. So I think when it starts to get too close to some places, I try to be respectful of the reader. Um, I'm not, and not to say other writers aren't, but they don't, they're a writer who wants to take a reader right to the edge, right to that emotional breakdown edge, hit them in the face with the gruesome stuff, all that stuff. That's not me. I don't want to do that. Um, probably again, because of what I've seen and done for 30 years, I'm happy to get away from that. And I'm happy not to drag my readers kicking and screaming to that edge with me just for the exercise of doing it. Um, and again, I'm not trying to say that's, that's what writers do, but I just don't want to go there. I want that escapism yeah. to be the primary reason they're there, the enjoyment of it. So I think, I think our job is we're entertainers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so and I think a writer has to moderate if, if world events are such that something you're about to write or have written is too close to home and, and too potentially painful. Sure. Some writers will say, well, that's the human condition is to suffer and I'm going to take them there. Mm. My view on it is I'm there to entertain and not to make anybody suffer. So I'm happy not to take them there and to, to revise um, yeah. something. So I, you know, I haven't, I've probably been there a couple of times close, but I, I kind of just am mindful going forward of the things I'm planning to write that I won't go to certain places. So, for instance, I won't touch on. I have a cousin. When I was twelve, um, we were visited. We, my family, were visited by a cousin of my dad's, who was an Israeli soldier. He was in his twenties. He was late twenties, early thirties at the time when I was twelve or thirteen, and he had fought in the Six Day War. He had yeah. shrapnel wounds, and he was a real hero to me. I looked at the first time I had ever met a real, honest to goodness soldier, let alone one who'd fought in war and battles. Um, so I looked up to him, uh, and I've always thought of that, you know, very much. Uh, I, I have a lot of empathy for the Israeli situation. And not that I don't have empathy for others in that whole area as well, but I have a blood relation that's there. And I often wonder what happened to them. But it's probably not a subject I'm going to write about to the level that would take someone to the horrors of what happened just the other week. Yeah, I, mean, I think publishers would would probably push you to write something different, go somewhere else, different probably. part of the world. Yeah. Um. So, see, perfect shot debut novel. 
Yes. Can you share with us a bit about your journey to publication for this one? I'd love to hear about your experiences during the query process with John, with John Talbot. I know you you had him in the, the first book, but like, how did that go? The submission process and any uh, valuable lessons you may have learned along the way. Absolutely. Well, as you guys can probably attest, um, the moment I became a serious writer was the moment I made the decision to go to Thriller Fest. In my mind, for me, that was my journey. I've been dabbling for years, all my life, really. I've been dabbling all my life. And then back around 2010 or so, I knew some people writing a TV show, uh, a television cop show up here called Flashpoint. Um, and the co-creators, Mark Ellis and Stephanie Morgenstern, I had met them in the writer's room talking about what a tactical medic does on a tactical team, police tactical team. And I had led on that I was interested in writing. And they had said at that moment, if you want to write, just write. They used a different word or description. Yeah. But basically, they said, don't let anybody stop you. Don't let any advice stop you. So I started writing back then. But it wasn't until I was still doing it kind of part-time on weekends, between shifts, whatever. And in 2017, I made a decision to, because I was halfway through my first manuscript now, and I thought, this sounds pretty good. Um, so I decided, well, I really want to finish it. And what better way to finish it than seeing a goalpost, you know, down the field. And for me, that goalpost was Pitch Fest, the Thriller Fest. So I made the decision I was going to finish a manuscript, go down to New York with a completed, uh, with a, you know, a, a, a novel ready to go, basically. And I was going to conquer New York 2018. So I went down, I pitched about a dozen agents or so, and, uh, uh, Obviously, uh, I wasn't successful that first year, but I just pulled up my socks, edited uh, what was by a long shot at the time, and went back in 2019. In 2019, I only pitched one agent, and that was John Talbot. And he liked the story. He liked the pitch. I think he liked me and my background. And uh, he asked for the full manuscript, which I sent him. Um, I was still heavily in revising the last version of that, and it went out to John. And within a few days, he took me on as a client. Um, then we went back into some revisions. John pointed out some things he wasn't sure about with the, that manuscript by a long shot. So we went into revisions from summer till winter. Um, and I was on deployment. I was at a military base in Eastern Ontario, uh, CFB Trenton, uh, Air Wing. Well, it's, a, it's an Air Wing military base, an RCAF military base. Um, we were doing the first quarantines for Canadians coming back with COVID. Hmm. And that's when we decided to go out on submission. We went out on submission, as you know, in, 20, or in 2020. And right away, COVID shut the world down. New York, all the publishing houses locked down or, or closed down. And everyone was working from home. So we pulled that manuscript back. Yeah. That's 2020. I then wrote Perfect Shot. I was right working on Perfect Shot at that time. It was called, it had a different title at the time. And I finished that in summer of 2021. Um, we went out on submissions almost right away. It was a couple months later, but I, the editing I did was for length. I finished Perfect Shot with 134,000 words. And before we went out on subs, I got it down to 110. Oh, my gosh. So I went out on <laughs> subs in the fall of 2021, um, and we got some offers by December, January, we locked up. Uh, terms, April 2022, I signed a contract, and here we are 18, 19 months later, ready to go for, uh, I guess, pub day is coming up in, yeah. in a few weeks in the short time, November 14th. So, yeah, it's it's been a long journey, but in many ways, not long. So did you never write a query letter? I did, yeah. Sorry. So when I came back from, when I came back from Pitch Fest, I sent out about 20 uh, query letters. Okay. Uh, from summer to fall, and then no, 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 no nothing, bite, right? no nothing, nothing. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to work on by a long shot. Um, I hired uh, an editor to work with me and help me, you know, help point out some potential pitfalls. And he really became more of a, a writing coach than an editor, a developmental developmental editor. That's tough to say with bourbon. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, we were ready to go. I was ready to go again by the next summer. And that's that was a timeline. But, yeah, yeah. it seems like a, it's a long time on the one hand. But you guys know the timelines aren't short oh, in this world. Yeah. And that was the hardest thing. And probably it's Simon Gervais 
who I met in 2018, who pulled me aside repeatedly, pulled me away from the edge of the cliff repeatedly and just said, it's a long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You're doing everything you have to do. Just keep doing it. You know, you're a good writer. It's going to get noticed. Just keep writing. Just yeah. keep your head down and do the work. That's easier and, said than done, man. Uh, we, we all know that. No, like, but it, just, it's good to have somebody yeah. telling you that. Yeah. Chris well, is going to be back to the ledge. Especially not, not writing, just about life. Yeah, and especially for me, <laughs> 30 years as a paramedic, you know, we're a, here's a call, four minutes later, you're on the scene, do your shit, fix something, off you go to the hospital, you're done. So you can save a life in under 30 minutes, or hopefully, you know, so it, you want to intervene quickly, and, and everything happens fast, so that's not publishing. <laughs> no. Saving life in 30 minutes, also hard to do with bourbon. Just uh, Also hard to do with bourbon, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably been attempted many times, not by me, but yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you mentioned Thriller Fest, um, and, and we talked a little bit about your publishing journey, but when we were all hanging out at Thriller Fest in, 2000, 20, in 2019, which was your second, our first, yeah, was this the publishing experience you envisioned, and what has been different both on the positive side and the negative side of the spectrum? Wow, great question. So the, as, as I mentioned, you know, the what I envisioned was um, finish a manuscript, find an agent, sign with an agent, submit your book, find someone to tell you how wonderful it is, give you a million dollars, Bob's your uncle, publish six months later. That was not the case. Um, in the last, since 2018, and even 2019, when I signed with John, and even 2020, we have seen the last, by we, I mean you, the three of us here, Mike included, um, every writer has seen the landscape change dramatically. And there are things that come in vogue, things that go, things that go out of vogue, things that are in favor now, things that aren't in favor. Um, you know, awakenings happen for a reason. Uh, the publishing world is a reflection of the social canvas. And there's a lot of bad stuff happening in our world, locally, domestically, um, internationally. And the publishing world is a microcosm of that and has to has to respond in the way they feel best to respond to it. And people, you know, people, people get chances, other people get chances, other people get chances again. There's a whole lot of things going on that we can't predict um, who we are, what we write, um, what we're entertained by, what the public will receive and be entertained by, what the publishing world thinks the public should be reading. So these are all things that are out of our control. And for someone like myself, I spent a career, 40 years being in control. That was my job. Control your environment, control what's going on. Don't let things get worse, make things better. Um, and then very much advising people, governments, administra not administrations, but you know, governments and, and bureaucrats on how to make things better or keep them from getting worse. So that kind of control as a writer, you have to give up. So. I was not expecting to have to wait so long and to leave my fate in the hands of others. So that was probably the greatest awakening and the biggest challenge for me is letting someone else take those reins out of my hands and steer, well, I was gonna say steer the ship, but now we're mixing metaphors every which way, but you know, steer the ship, steer the horse, whatever, you know, in a way that I hadn't envisioned and that I have no, absolutely no control over. And that became the other part is the acceptance piece. You know, you can control the things you can control and everything else you you have to just accept they're not in your hands and somebody else's hands. And hopefully you have someone else. Like for me, I had Simon Gervais. Um, you guys are friends as well. And I've reached out to you guys over time. We text message over the years and commiserate about this or that. So, yeah, it was a lot different. But at the same time, it's been a friendly world to me. Um, I've been very, uh, you know, like I said, I don't want to get in trouble with St. Martin's, but I'd be very surprised by how great everybody's been. And, and that sounds terrible, but what I mean by that is the publishing experience for me has been so wonderful. My team around me, my editor, Sarah Grill, my publicist and marketing guy, um, Hector DeGene and Steve Erickson, um, Kelly Ragland at Minotaur, everybody there has been phenomenal at supporting me and encouraging me. John Talbot, of course, is my cheerleader and and uh, uh, biggest adversary and and the guy who takes the tackles when I might be standing in the way of something coming, whatever it is. So I've been surprised at how collegial it is once I'm in it. 
uh, despite the challenges of the timelines and and some of the other things that go on. The timelines suck. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they just uh, I can't tell you how often and you know we all know how many times you hit refresh on your email just like is that email coming today? Is it coming today? Yeah. Is it coming today? No, it's not coming today. How about tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it's uh does it come tomorrow either? Um, and being out on subs is the worst. Oh know, yeah, tell me about it. it. It's it's <laughs> well, it's better it's, than not being out on subs. Yeah, I can tell you yeah. I don't know. Oh, Sean. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't. It's the penultimate know. suck. <laughs> it's uh, wait, what Josh? You, we mentioned uh, Josh Hood before, or I think it was him. He said in Afghanistan or is that Iraq? I forget which. He, he probably was in both. But you got to embrace, embrace the, the suck. suck. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's publishing. Um, yeah. So, Steve, you've received some amazing blurbs from some of the top thriller authors in the business. You had Jack Carr. Jack said, Jack said, um, perfect shot hits with maximum impact. Read it today. Mark Graney, what does he, what Mark Graney say? He said, uh, full of high octane thrills and intricate details that bristle with authenticity. You got Mark Cameron says stuff. Robert Dugani says stuff. First off, how much did it cost you to get those blurbs? A fortune, man. <laughs> My entire 401k. Yeah, that's, what I, that's that. what I thought. That's what I thought. It's, that's a shit done. And that's only some of the uh, great blurbs you got. Um, so then, after you paid all that money, yeah. how did it feel when you read what they wrote about you and Perfect Shot? It, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. I mean, again, you guys know, um, I'll go back to Thriller Fest and what a shock it was to see how friendly <laughs> writers are. And what a community, a supportive community this is, where it's not it's not cutthroat. It's not, if you do well, I'm going to do shitty. Therefore, I'm going to hope you do shitty so I do well. It's not like that at all. Yeah. It's very supportive. So the Bob Degonis and Jack Cars and Mark Rainey's, um, you know, obviously there's a way to ask anybody anything. Um, and it, it's not just to meet somebody and shake their hand and say, by the way, can you blurb my book? So there's obviously ways to do it. <laughs> ways to present yourself to them so but it's luck and it, it, you rely on you rely on the good graces of others and there are so many people who are willing to give you the shirt off their back literally or turn around and say absolutely i'll blurb your book you know, I'm, I'm thinking going why <laughs> <laughs> why right. why are you gonna blurb my book yeah who who so, am i <laughs> yeah who am i so i i'm i'm very grateful um I was shocked, and the more I get into it, you know, and now I, I, I'm surprised to this day I get people asking me for blurbs, and I'm happy to do it, and I still say, why? <laughs> Who am I to blurb your book? But at the same time, I recognize that um, I'm happy to do it because it's the community, you know, you you give to get. I hate saying it that way. It's not transactional. It's it's no. kind of the, the Christian. We know what you mean. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all forward. about do unto others it's, as you would have them do unto it's you. It's biblical. It's our, if you want to go that way, it's in giving that we receive, and, and it's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah, and uh, so I don't know. I've been. I, I can't account for why people have been so generous, um, because they don't know what's going to be a book. It could be an awful book when they get it, um, but they're generous enough to take the time to read it and send me these wonderful blurbs. I'm just so grateful. I, I don't know even how to answer I, that. Obviously, obviously, Perfect Shot is not awful. Uh, it is fantastic, and obviously... Uh, you know, Jack Carr, Mark Graney, Ryan Stack, Brett Burton, Bob Dugani, Mark Cameron, Jeff Rovin, Linwood Barclay, even all thought was spectacular enough to uh, to give you that blurb. So, but Sean, let's let's raise a glass because Steve has made it through our traditional portion of the interview. Well, I wasn't Cheers, sure. There were some moments I thought he might fall off and falter, but no, he made it. He, Cheers. He on us, I think he, he's watched too many of our shows to know, and he was prepared. He's prepared, but now is he prepared for the lightning round, which is neither lightning nor really a round. I get three questions, Sean. Kind of just three questions. Things. Flatter thing. Yeah, this um, this may kill your career before it even begins. Just it's like it's this it's post that you you put on social media about uh, beaver tails, <laughs> eating beaver tails, um, isn't in fact a beaver's tail because I've never had this. You've never had a beaver tail. No. <laughs> Sean, have you had a beaver tail? <laughs> I mean, once you've eaten... My attorney has is, is recommended that you not answer that question. <laughs> once you've eaten a beaver tail, your life changes dramatically. So Does it? 
A uh, beaver tail is, I think it's probably pizza dough, to be honest with you, but it's it's basically dough that's, I think it's deep fried. And yeah. then if you look up beaver tails as an item, it's a, it's a chain that started in Ottawa, where okay. our friend Simon hails from, or lives right now anyway. So it's a chain based in Ottawa. Uh, they have a number of outlets around. So a big shout out to beaver, ta- beaver tails. Well, what it's is it flavored with? It's it, well, we're getting to that. Okay, hold, just, hold yourself there. It's shaped, it's in the shape of it's a lightning oh, round, damn it. Faster, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's in the shape of a beaver tail. And it's you put sugar on it, and Nutella on it, or maple syrup on it, or banana on it. Or so, like, there's 10 different ways you can throw different ingredients on a beaver tail and eat the beaver tail. No kidding. So, is it's, it uh, possible? Is yeah. it possible that it is a close cousin to the elephant ear of the funnel ear? Yeah, North America. it is very possible it's a version of that, but being a Canadian chain, it's all about yeah. beaver. Yeah, <laughs> you can quote me on that. <laughs> it just went off the rails, Sean. It just went all right. <laughs> First question, too. It says, Well, this is, I love it. I love it. By the way, uh, I don't think you can uh, export it or import it into the United <laughs> States. Um, you can't take money for beaver, that's at least <laughs> it's a tax. <laughs> I've heard that's illegal. In, in, certain, in certain counties, <laughs> yes. In certain counties, it's... Anyway, uh, moving on. Number two. On. <laughs> See, what's the best part of retirement? Because uh, I'm just dying to get there. I mean, not literally, but figuratively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not going to work, I'll be honest with you. Best part of retirement is, you know what? I, I'm semi-retired because, of course, I'm working full-time as a writer. So I'm doing what I love to do. I've left right. that other working world behind for now. I mean, I haven't ruled out, you know, going back and dabbling. I'm still young enough and, you know, in demand a little bit with some of the skills I have. So I have dabbled in going back and I still consult a little bit, but it's just nice to wake up on your own timeline and kind of schedule your day the way you want it. So, so I got looking to forward to that. Can we? <laughs> um, all right. Number three, the original title of Perfect Shot was? Render Safe. What happened? Renders, I love the title render safe, um, very much a technical term in the bomb disposal world, like the, um, you know, explosive ordinance. Yeah. Disposal and you world. actually write it in, it's in the story too. It's like one of the lines because I remember yeah. reading, I'm like, ah, that was the title. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I, I think, so the, my editors, my editor and, and the editorial team had a bit of a, a moment where they thought render safe, very technical, speaks to the book, but it doesn't really speak to the character of Alex. So while it speaks to the book, maybe it's not the right title to start the series. So they thought Perfect Shot spoke more to her skill as a sniper, but also there were enough double meanings that you could imply different right. things from the title or apply different things from the title to Alex and the series, et cetera. So I think it's a perfect title. I really am, I, you know, I, I wasn't stuck on Render Safe, and I think Perfect Shot was a perfect alternative. I love it. Yeah, it, work, it works very well. It works, yeah. well. but I, I also think "Render Safe" is a very cool title, and Thank hopefully, you. hopefully, somewhere else in the series, you'll be able to yeah. use it. Um, also, "Beaver Tales" that would be a great title. <laughs> Beaver Tales. Um, depending, on, depending, on depending on the plot. Wait, 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 hold on. Before you, there was someone else that was on our show years ago. Otters, not beavers, but you know, some otters. Yeah, yeah. otters. Yes. Okay. Mm. All right. Rat tail right. versus a beaver tail. So <laughs> my first question. And, I, and I'm getting more, I like to go deeper and get more personal. Um, mm. Chris likes to stay, you know, on the, on the profession. So what was the cruel Going cerebral. Nickname? What was the, no, no, not more cerebral. No. Um, what was the cruel nickname children made out of your last name when you were young? You stinky. Oh, really? That's not, not at all where I thought it would go. I mean, I get your Zensky all the time. They love to throw a K in there. Your Zensky, yeah. Zensky was there, but you stinky. You stinky. Yeah, I was thinking you know, classic. It's like more of a emphasis on your zany or well, your like, zany or anything. Yeah, your zany. No, they never. You know, it's funny. They never. I don't know. They were dumb. I guess they never saw that. But <laughs> you know, I say uh, my my son pronounces it your zany. I used to say your zany. Now I stick more with ursani. Um, it's nowhere near the Canadian, the Hungarian version, right. which I'm not even going to try to pronounce right now. But but yeah, so your zany, yeah. ursani. But yeah. All right, well, there you go. So, but you worked that out, right? In therapy, it, 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 it's, it's, okay. yeah. he still remembers, it, he still remembers it, though. He still remembers. The second, my second question is very important because it's been asked of 
somebody who was very instrumental, you said, in keeping you grounded mm-hmm. or not grounded, but not uh, Nickelback. <laughs> um, what is the best Canadian rock band of all time? Blue Rodeo. Oh, wow. Blue Rodeo. I mean, Rush. Okay. I was going to say, well, because I was going to say not name Rush. So that was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is Rush is. Name? Rush is a me. I mean, how could you not? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely Rush. Rush. But beyond Rush. No, actually, and I'm Getty I'm Lee, big... by the way, Getty Lee has a book coming out on the same day as Perfect Shot. Really? My F in Life by Getty Lee comes out. Do you November. have his um, publicist number? Yeah. I do not. Anyway, we do a Canadian double feature, for God's <laughs> yeah. sake. That's yeah. great. Um, <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Um, well, we'd love to have that on, for the record, on the one of my favorite songwriters of all time is Gordon Lightfoot. Oh, absolutely. RIP. Okay, my my mm. uh, third question is: What Canadian historical figure, who is not well known in America, should be, and why? Justin Trudeau. Oh wait, no, he's not historical. Wow, what Canadian historical figure? I know. I I'm, I'm digging. This is a deep cut. Yeah, <laughs> this is a typical lightning round. Who or who just you know who is somebody in Canadian history that just the average American just isn't Sp- aware of? But maybe, maybe sports. Maybe, Music, freedom fighter. I'm a bad Canadian. I mean, if you know what, I'm going to go with uh, Banting and Best. I'm going with Banting and Best. I don't know how many people are aware of who the discoverers of insulin was. No, no. But Frederick Banting and Douglas Best. I'm I'm going to I'm probably butchering. I can't remember his last name, but so Banting and Best discovered insulin at the University of Toronto back in the turn of the 20th century. I guess it was. Okay. And um, they they took their discovery, insulin, up to the, the dying ward at a children's hospital in Toronto and injected children dying from diabetes, all in diabetic comas. And it was a miracle when ver- I think pretty much every child in that room who was on the verge of death woke up and began talking. I'd say that was a really good choice for that yeah, answer. And, yeah, but then what happened next was certainly something you wouldn't do today. Banting gave his discovery. He sold the discovery, I think, for a dollar. Yeah. And said that no one should profit from this <laughs> life-saving drug. <laughs> tell that to, tell that to Shkreli or I was going to say, so, so basically like the entire industry in today's day. <laughs> yeah. So I would say... Yeah, I, that's... Crazy. I would say single-handedly, I mean, there's a miracle of miracles, the discovery of this, we call it a drug, but, you know, whatever, it's a hormone, yeah. whatever, that saves lives every day, tens of thousands upon tens of yeah. thousands. I went to school, my, my first classes at university were in the building where insulin was discovered. So I would say Frederick Banting that's and Mr. Best. Or uh, all, only, yeah, that was a great answer. Only a Canadian would uh, would give it to the world for a dollar. Since, <laughs> yeah, but it's actually 75 cents in America. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Seven and a half but, cents. <laughs> <laughs> no, <but> anyway, <laughs> uh, I, since Mike's not here, um, I feel like I should ask a bonus question. And, and, and this is actually more about exercise. I would like you to repeat the following sentence. The lout who would shout is out and about. Who would shout is out and about. Oh, no boat. Okay. All right. That works. Well, maybe you should make him say judges, judges will accept out in a boat. <laughs> out in a boot. Out in a boat. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how we're going to end it, Steve. <laughs> we're going to end it. Out in a boat. Always end on a high note. Out, out, out in a boat. A high note. A high note. <laughs> there it is. Uh, perfect shot. Your debut comes out November 14th, 2023. Uh, we love this book. Alex Martel is a fantastic protagonist. It is a perfect book cheers sir Perfectly book, said. do you have a title thank you oh. it has a working title which i am not and we probably allowed uh, we like it though we we always try to get those out but cheers cheers cheers, cheers. thanks guys awesome. glad you're here my friend i'm glad thank you for having me hey sean boy uh yes. perfect. wait a minute uh who's this my was a fantastic interview what? It was, wasn't it? It was yeah, great. I learned a lot. I learned a lot tonight. The chemistry well, uh, was great. Uh, yeah. F- fill me in. What What exactly did you learn? Traffic here sucks. Um, mm. Mm. Uh, working sucks. Does. Um, but you know what doesn't suck? Mike? What's that? 
Perfect shot Perfect by shot. Steve Yerzani. That does not it. suck. In That's fact, it. perfect. Yeah, it was awesome. Just like Steve. Perfect guest. Perfect writer. So, guys, I want to propose. There's a new feature. A new feature. Oh. I'm, I'm now proposing, and I'm also approving a new feature on the crew reviews. Oh. And it's called "What Have We Learned Today?" Oh. Okay. Oh. And today, what we learned is that Steve Rosani went to Pitch Fest, and it, it didn't go well. But it doesn't matter because what he said was, you know what? I need to go back and, and fix the book. And he went and he fixed the book and then he presented it the next year. And of course, the book worked. The other thing we learned today mm -hmm. was that Chris Albanese pronounces nuclear like George Bush pronounces nuclear. 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 Nuclear, so, nuclear in the Albanese dictionary is spelled N U K U L A R. It's nuclear. not. It's not Part, partial paralysis of the left side of his tongue. That's what I'm thinking. Right so now. welcome to what have we learned on the crew reviews? New feature. Um, nice. <laughs> my yeah, this, this, you know, this, need you back. I think we're going to nuke Stop it. working. Stop saving people's lives. I, right? I need to. I, I need to get back to hanging out. I think you can save where... people's lives or you can make people's lives better. You make Here's my life better. Seriously. You're a ray of sunshine. All right. Well, let's make it happen. Mm. <laughs> See you in the next one. All right. Can't drink. Can't drink if you hit a dock. Pilots can do it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah.